I'm going to talk about river crossings, their various types, and their great importance in the olden days in this video, which has been sponsored very kindly by the Great Courses Plus, but I'll get to that in a bit. Now, the first point I want to make is that in the minds of the people of the past, and when I say people of the past, I'm really talking about all sorts of people in the olden days, all around the world until uh, the modern world, uh, but I suppose, yes, I will be taking most of my examples uh, from uh, Britain and particularly the medieval period. But anyway, what I'm about to say really does apply much more widely than that, uh, that, that narrow field of example. Um, in the mind of the people of the past, River crossings were enormously more important. They would have been far more aware, far more conscious of where all the various river crossings in their area were. Now, I've talked in a previous video about how um, rivers were enormously more uh, important as, as highways for moving things along up and down them in boats than they are today. Um, but you just imagine if you are conscious of where the rivers are, you're going to be conscious of where the river crossings are because those enormously affect how you can move about your world on land. If you want to get a wagon from here to there and there's a river in the way, that's a big problem if the nearest bridge is a few miles that way. And this puts me in mind the scene in The Fellowship of the Ring, one of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, uh, in which uh, the hobbits, you may remember, are trying to escape uh, the clutches of the ring wraiths who are after them. And uh, at one point, Frodo says, you know, I've really got to get out of the Shire. And uh, one of the other hobbits, Merry or Pippin, I can never remember which is which, says, Buckleberry Ferry, follow me. And it's pretty handy as it turns out, because would you believe it, Buckleberry Ferry is just across a, 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 a fence and just 50 yards away, and there they are. Amazing, and, and, and none of the others, it seems, even knew how close they were to the, uh, an easy avenue of escape. Uh, so they get on the, the ferry, and in a conversation about the significance of this geographical ploy, uh, this exchange occurs. How far to the nearest crossing? The Brandywine Bridge. 20 miles. Right. So uh, the detour is 20 miles to Brandywine Bridge. Um, so they, they realise they've pulled off a bit of a coup. That's how far the ring raids have got to go. So they've got ages to get away uh, from the ring raids. Um, and in the mind, in fact, why didn't, why didn't Frodo know about those two river crossings? Well, it's, it's almost as though he asked Merry or Pippin so that Merry or Pippin could then tell us, the audience. Well, yeah, it's a scriptwriter's ploy. Anyway, um, so people in the past would have been much more conscious of these things. Now, you today, sitting comfortably in, in your, your home, might uh, check on the interweb how to get to a certain place in your car, and you are here, and the place is there, and the road goes like that, and then like that. And so you think, OK, that's the only bit of the route I need to know. That's the only bit you might describe to someone else. Never mentioning, never caring the fact you have to cross a river here and here, because in a modern world, if a, a road crosses a river, well, it, it, it doesn't interrupt your car at all. The car is quite unaware. It just speeds across the, 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 the river uh, through a tunnel or over a bridge or something. That they'll have sorted that out. The, you know, the, the, the roads work because that's modern infrastructure for you. But in, the, in the, the olden days, getting across a river was a little bit more complicated quite often. And bridges were quite a bit rarer than they are today. Now, uh, the first... Uh, obvious way you can get across a river is you can ford it. So you can, you can cross at a ford, a, a shallow bit. Now, of course, a ford can be natural, but fords, uh, where they were used fairly often by man, had to be maintained. They had to be contrived. Uh, the, the, the floor of the ford was very often cobbled or paved uh, to make it harder and more resistant to being washed away. So a certain amount of effort went into contriving the ford in the first place and keeping it uh, as a working ford. And now there are some big advantages and some quite definite disadvantages of Fords. Uh, one, that you've probably have spotted already, is you get your feet wet. Uh, all going well, maybe just to the ankle, uh, up to the knee perhaps. You wouldn't want to go much deeper than that, all going well. But yes, uh, that's one disadvantage. Um, whereas an advantage is it turns out that uh, the Earth's crust is really thin thick and can su support very heavy loads. It's extremely buoyant, the tectonic plate on its, on its uh, sea of magma below, uh, much more uh, buoyant than a boat on a river could uh, ever be, and much stronger than a bridge. So you can get massive loads in your huge wagon across a ford, which might threaten the local bridge. Um, so that's, uh, that's an advantage, but a disadvantage is that it's so shallow at a ford that effectively the river is now not navigable. If you've contrived a ford, well, how are the boats going to get past? So if you've got a, a navigable with a river, a ford is no use whatsoever. The boats have to get past because the, the, the rivers are highways for, for transport in boat form. Um, so um, 
that's Fords. And when a bridge is built, it's usually not built instead of the Ford, it's built at first alongside the Ford. So a very common arrangement would be a road which then forks and one way goes across the river on a bridge. You can keep your feet dry, but maybe you have to pay a toll to get across the bridge. Or you can go down, get your feet wet, cross the ford and up the other side. And when the big flash flood comes in winter after those incredible rains, it might sweep away the bridge but leave the ford. So you don't want to get rid of the ford when you build the bridge. So it was a very common arrangement to have both, uh, one right next to the other. Now, uh, bridges in England uh, made out of stone don't really get going in large numbers until the time of King John, you know, Magna Carta 1215 and all that. Um, and very often, if there's a stone bridge, actually this referred to bridges in general, but particularly a nice stone medieval bridge, it might have been built as an act of piety by, by some local rich do-gooder. You see, if you want all the people of this area, which is separated by this river from this area, and you want all the people of this area as well to know just what a great guy you are, What's the best advertising hoarding uh, that you, you, could, uh, you could rent for, for announcing that to everyone? You build a bridge between those two areas and now all the people here trying to get to here will have to go immediately past your advertising hoarding, uh, your, your memorial bridge, your, your goodness look at me aren't I so flipping pious bridge. And so everyone will know that that was the bridge that you built and everyone will see it and everyone will think you're great and thank you daily and perhaps even pray for your soul. Bridges were a bit holy. Um, a lot of uh, bishops and the like would sell indulgences. They would sell um, time off in purgatory. Uh, so you could get a, you know, get a bit of time off in purgatory, you're more likely to go to heaven quickly because you did this pious act, you did a pilgrimage, you thanked God, you got rich, you thanked God by building a bridge and you got to tell everyone in the area how fab you were. And it was very common for bridges to have a chapel actually on them uh, or immediately next to them. Uh, so that people could uh, pray for your soul and, and just say, oh, you're such a great guy, you're such a great guy, you built a bridge, well done. Um, so uh, that's one re re reason that a lot of stone bridges, particularly away from towns, got, uh, got built. It, what sort of bridge got built depended also where you were in, in the world. So if you're in some wild, rugged area, uh, you might um, just have a wooden bridge or just a ford because even a good stone bridge would get swept away by those floods every flipping winter or maybe every second winter. And after you've rebuilt a stone bridge 17 times, you might think, oh, do you know what, should we just make do with a ford? Or maybe we'll just have a wooden bridge. Yeah, the wooden bridge will be swept away as well. It's not any more resistant, but at least it's much easier to rebuild a wooden bridge. So in the wilder, ruggedy areas, more rugged areas, you tend not to have the, the spectacular stone bridges of the, 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 the lowlands. And the lowlands particularly where they have a, a wide, sluggish and, and reliable river not given to uh, uh, terrifying torrents. Uh, it might be built on a series of piers. So you have a series of platforms known as piers, and these would be stone platforms that would support the many arches crossing the river in several stages. Whereas in the wilder, hillier, rainier areas of Britain, you tended to have a single span going the entire way because you didn't want any floods hitting those piers. Now, the piers, even though you would put a prow on each pier facing into the, into the current to try to um, uh, get good hydrodynamics so that you didn't uh, uh, impede the water too much, but even so, they really did slow the water, water down a lot. And so the water coming up to a bridge and the water flowing away could be of, of appreciably different levels. And it slowed the water down quite a bit. So this, this, this um, uh, higher area, uh, the, the volume of water here is pushing against the bridge. It's, you know, if it's a wide river, it's a lot of weight of water constantly straining at the bridge, and even big, well-made bridges did get uh, destroyed. And the river might be slowed down so much that it could uh, affect it quite uh, dramatically. For instance, London Bridge, uh, the famous London Bridge, which was built on several piers going across the river, slowed the Thames down so much that it used to freeze every year, and they would even hold markets on the Thames um, and just beyond the, the bridge. Uh, but then when London Bridge was replaced by a, a single span bridge going across the Thames, then immediately the river sped up so much more that the river didn't freeze again. Um, so um, 
Yes, so there you go, Stone Bridge. There's actually a, a, a stone, the, the, the Stone Bridge, it's at a place called Twizel or Twizel. Uh, it's in Northumberland, which is not very far from me in, in that direction. Um, and for three centuries in England, uh, that was the longest single stone span bridge there was. Uh, and so clearly it was very well, very well built. Uh, and uh, actually it, it uh, played a not insignificant part in the Battle of Flodden in 1513, um, the, the Scots had invaded England uh, with a huge army. Actually, this wasn't just a little raid. This was a 40,000 strong army, which in, the, in those days, that was a big army. And they'd taken the several castles. They weren't mucking around. This was a, a serious invasion. Um, uh, the Scots were in, in, up on uh, Flodden Hill in a very good defensive position, but the English under the Earl of no, Surrey, the Earl of Surrey, um, uh, he, he sent his vanguard, of, uh, his vanguard and his artillery across the bridge at Twizel uh, and was able then to oblige the Scots to relocate. So in fact, the Battle of Flodden didn't actually happen at Flodden because they left Flodden Hill for a, a less good position, which is where the, the, the main fighting then uh, happened. Uh, some people say that the Scots didn't know that the, the, the bridge was there because it had only just been built a couple of years before. I think that's unlikely. I think they probably did know. I think they were well informed enough to know that it was there, or they would sent out have sent out scouts, and they would have found out. Uh, but anyway, so uh, the, the, and they ended up uh, the Scots being beaten. Uh, but James the Fourth did get into the history books. Uh, so well done. Uh, he became the last reigning monarch to die in battle on British soil. Um, so bad luck. Uh, but he, he didn't go to hell. Actually, uh, so that, that's 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 terrible. That's terrible. Because he did go. We know he went to hell because he had been excommunicated. Ha! Huh. Okay, I need to explain why. Okay, so uh, why wasn't the the King of England, who was Henry VIII at the time, why wasn't he leaving the English? Well, he was busy doing God's work. He was in France fighting Frenchmen in defence of uh, the, the Pope and various uh, Italian states that were being attacked by the French. And the Pope had given Henry VIII his blessing, of course, which you would. I mean, he's defending you and he's doing God's work fighting the French. But the, the, the Scots would so often take the opportunity to invade England every time uh, the English king went away to France uh, to you know, do God's work. And they, they, it'd be like when the cat's away, the mice will, pl uh, will play sort of thing. Uh, but also they could say, ah, oh, we are honouring the old alliance. Uh, with, with France, you see, the, the natural enemy of the English, um, and so they always had that excuse. But uh, because the, uh, the English were doing this in defence of the Pope and, and various Italian states, um, James IV got excommunicated. And uh, this was also uh, for breach of a treaty, because would you believe it? Henry VIII, I think, had some reason to believe that James IV wouldn't um, uh, invade, because um, Henry VIII had had the basic decency to marry his sister to James IV. But even though James IV was married to Henry VIII's sister, he still invaded the cat. Uh, anyway, so then he died, and because he had been excommunicated, he went to hell. We know that. It's fact. Or was it? Uh, I mean, to be honest, to me, that comes across as evidence that these people didn't really believe in all this God and the Pope and, and hell and heaven stuff, because... People kept getting excommunicated. Now, if you genuinely, if you genuinely believed, actually believed that you were going to go to hell, eternal damnation for doing a thing, and someone said, don't do the thing or we'll excommunicate you and this will happen, well, you wouldn't do the thing, would you? I mean, that would be just the ultimate threat that really would work on people. Eternal damnation, you can get no, if you genuinely believe that was your fate, you, you cannot get more threatened than that. So they just wouldn't believe it. Uh, so they wouldn't act the way they did, and yet, James IV carried on with his invasion, he got excommunicated, and what about the 40,000 men following him? Don't you think some of them would have thought, well, if he got excommunicated for doing this and that, because this is wrong, and we're all doing this, so are we doing wrong? Isn't that going to eternally damn us as well? And yeah, it didn't seem, to, didn't seem to bother them at all. They carried on uh, following their king until he got killed. Um, yeah, there was a bit of a, a, a sidetrack there. Um, uh, so Henry VIII, yes, Henry VIII was... I mean, if you want my opinion, which possibly you don't, but you're getting it anyway, Henry VIII was really the last medieval king of England. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute, surely that was Richard III. Richard III, uh, he, he gave battle in vain, Richard of York, uh, got killed, Battle of Bosworth, 1485. 
That's the date when uh, British historians have said, right, that's it, that's the end of the medieval period, Battle of Bosworth has been fought, rule the line, that's there, the end of the medieval period, okay? But you know what, the, the day after the Battle of Bosworth, people were, had the same technology, they had the same religion, they had the, most of the same attitudes of mind. The world was still essentially the same, it was still a medieval world. And when Henry VIII became king, he had a, a medieval king's idea of what a king was supposed to do. He was supposed to um, marry a, a princess to secure an alliance, so he married Catherine of Aragon of Spain. Good job done, Spain, powerful country, did well there. And uh, he's meant to marry your own uh, uh, sisters off to various other kings to secure alliances. Okay, that doesn't always work, but you know, you can, that's what you do. And you wear armor, you lead uh, armies from the front, you fight the French. This is what a king does, and that's how Henry VIII behaved at the start of his reign. But it was, it was later, it was during his reign, that he started coming up with new ideas. He got divorced. Well, that's a bit modern, isn't it? And then he thought, you know what, I've had enough of all this being subservient to the Pope business. I'll just form my own church, call it the Church of England, no Pope. Much simpler. What an incredibly amazing, you might say progressive or original a step and brave a step to take. Quite extraordinary. And and it was in his time where he said, right, that's it, I've had enough of this feudalism, I've had enough of this, oh, you know, these various earls and barons, they owe their loyalty to me and they have various people who owe loyalty to them and if I want to raise an army or a navy or whatever, I have to get every guy to get all the guys who are under him to gather their little forces and little bits come together. It takes ages to assemble an invasion fleet to, to fight the French. To do what? Get rid of all that. I'm, I'm, enough of this feudalism. Let's just have you know, a, a state navy, let's just have the royal navy, and I'm the only person who's allowed to have a navy, and I'm the king, and that's how it's going to be, so we're going to tax the people, out of taxation we'll just have a navy, it's a standing royal navy that, that fights all the wars, other people can do the trade stuff, this is a much better way, this is the way forward. And um, um, I realised that I've, I've really gone off on a massive tangent, ah, oh, but I can bring it back, I can bring it back, because it was... In uh, Henry VIII's time, the Parliament passed uh, the Bridges Act of 80, no, of uh, 1530, 1531, around there. Uh, and that was only superseded, by the way, in the 1950s, would you believe? So that the, the, the Act was in force for a very long time. And this, again, was another stepping stone to the modern nation-state. Okay, he perhaps wasn't thinking in terms of that, the, the term hadn't been coined, but this was, yeah, a, a stepping stone on the way to the modern nation-state. So. Uh, he said, right, uh, we can't be relying on the local guild of this and this benefactor and this pious guy and these pilgrims to, to, to build and maintain these bridges just wherever they want piecemeal. There's got to be a, a better system than this. Right, so the Bridges Act. And now he, 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 various regions of Britain, cities and so forth, would be, would, be, would be responsible for building and permanently maintaining, yes, permanently maintaining bridges. So there'll be a proper, consistent infrastructure. That's what we want. Progress, damn it. And um, then he, he wrote green sleeves and, you know, Renaissance man. So there you go, Renaissance period. He's no longer a medieval king. So uh, there you go. In my, in my view, uh, it, it's actually the end of the medieval period. It's really during, at least in England, it's really during Henry VIII's reign. Um, and um, uh, I, I tell you what, I'll do, I'll do the advert now <laughs> before I get, I talk more about Henry VIII, who's really you know, not got all that much to do with bridges. Um, now, my extremely kind and, and lovely and patient uh, sponsor is the Great Courses Plus. And if you don't know what that is, frankly you should, but you probably do because you, you're likely to have watched some of these videos before. Um, uh, one of my first ever sponsors, they've been, they've been with me right from the beginning of, of my having sponsors, uh, which is great. And uh, they are so well matched to this channel because they're about being learned and stuff. Look, books, you see? You see, this, this is my new home, by the way. Uh, and one of the problems, you probably guessed, different background. Uh, one of the problems with making this video, by the way, is that as I'm recording now, I don't have proper working internet here at the moment, which is going to make making this, uh, this little section of the video a little bit challenging, but I can sort it out in post. Anyway, uh, they get uh, top distinguished professors from august universities from around the world, though admittedly largely from the eastern United States, uh, to uh, record, to come to their studios and record lectures on all sorts of topics about geography and history and science and maths maths with an S, because it's an abbreviation of mathematics, um, 
And uh, there, are, there are also how to do things like uh, cookery and photography and so forth. Uh, but it, it, it tends to be more towards the, the academic leaning. So if you want to find out about all sorts of things, like here, appearing on your screen, are, are some examples of, of, of courses on all sorts of topics. You see, it's wide and varied, and there are thousands to pick from. So there'll be something that you're interested in. Um, and if you want to find out more about all this, you can get a free trial um, by going to www.thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke lindybeige or, much easier, clicking the link in the description beneath this video. You're not limited, you can watch as many of these lectures as you like. You can take notes, you had a wild time. And, oh joy, oh joy, at the end of it, there are no exams. Uh, which is great. Um, admittedly, uh, drawback is that you can't get a degree. They, they don't award a degree, so it's not quite the same as going to university. Although, if you are at university, I dare say that if you saw some uh, lectures from a particularly distinguished professor uh, in your particular topic, then that would give you that would give you a, a head start over your colleagues, and you could look ever so clever in front of your your lecturers. But don't ever do that. Um, so, um, if you go to www.thegreatcoursesplus.com, stroke Lindy Beige, click the description, then you can get a free trial. And uh, one of the lectures, which is uh, the thing, you don't have to do a whole course either. You can, if you, there's one lecture on something, you can go straight to that. For instance, this lecture, which you can see straight away, is absolutely pertinent uh, to what I'm talking about here. And you know, that wasn't difficult to find because there are just so many from which to pick. Uh, now, I know what you might be thinking, though, is that is the lecturer really, really top-notch in terms of his gestures? Well, let's have a look at it, look at the lecturer go, and, ha, ah, well, I, 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 I think I hardly need comment, frankly. Gestures like that, they speak for themselves, so you can know that you are in safe hands. Right, so uh, that's the Great Courses Plus, my extremely kind sponsor. Now, I'm going to get back to... Uh, the uh, meat of this video, which is about river crossing. So the next type of river crossing after fords and bridges I'm going to talk about is the, well, today they're usually referred to as cable ferries. Before that they were referred to as chain ferries, and but before that um, they were called rope ferries. Now um, a cable is, uh, the, the, the modern steel cable, very smooth, very strong, amazing high tensile strength. They really only uh, become common in the 19th century. So that is a fairly modern technology. Before that, we had uh, chains when um, large amounts of iron were being made and iron was tolerably cheap. Uh, but before that, most of these would have been plain old rope ferries. And it's a pretty simple idea. And possibly uh, Buckleberry Ferry, which uh, in Lord of the Rings appears to be just just a, a raft with some punting poles, so it looks as though some, someone could deliberately or accidentally just end up going punting off down the river and uh, leave everyone else trying to get across the river at that point stranded. Uh, maybe that should really have been a rope ferry, but anyway, uh, with rope ferry, pretty simple idea. You have a rope, it's attached to the shore over there, it's attached to the shore over there, it passes through something that's attached to the boat, like a hoop or whatever, and the people on the boat pull on the rope, and by this method they pull themselves across the river dead easy. And if it's a smallish boat, it's very easy for just one person to do that and you'll, you'll get across, no bother. If, now, if it has to be very, very big, of course, uh, it might be quite a lot of effort to, uh, to pull the, the rope or the chain or the cable. Um, but with, with modern technology, you can get really big uh, cable ferries with really big, powerful winches aboard and, and they can get you from one side to the other. Uh, but it may be you're worried about the navigability of the river because surely by stringing a rope across the river like that all the boats will get annoyed and not be able to get past. Well, actually, uh, there are two ways around that. Uh, the more old-fashioned way, which you could use in a deeper river, is to have quite a lot of slack in the rope. So as you pull the rope taut there, so that bit of the rope is taut, and you pull the ferry this way, there's an awful lot of slack in that bit of the uh, rope or chain, and that dips down into the water deeply enough so that uh, boats can, uh, can pass over the top. Uh, so that's one solution to the problem. There is another way, uh, but I believe this to be a modern one, and that is to have the cable so high above the river uh, that boats can sail straight underneath it. Uh, but then you can't, you can't reach it, it's out of reach. So what you have to do is you have something called a traveller, so it's a little wheeled trolley that's attached to the cable up there with another cable running down to the boat. Uh, this all has to be extremely strong, that tape cable has to be very high tension and, and very taut, and I don't think 
that that was ever done in medieval times or earlier. I think with ropes and blocks and tackles, that arrangement really wouldn't work very well at all. I think that's a, uh, a design which works with uh, modern uh, high-tension cables. Uh, so there you go. So there's a, a cable ferry. Um, good if there's not too much traffic going across the river uh, and uh, they, they keep you reasonably safe in storms because e even if there's really terrible weather you're anchored to this, this chain or rope or cable so you should, all going well, be fairly safe. Uh, they can operate in fairly shallow water which is good um, and uh, they, we know that they were used for quite some while in the past. In fact, it's, we're pretty sure they go back to prehistoric times. Uh, there's the, the Hampton Ferry in England, which is referred to in the 13th century, uh, and they were used until really quite modern times. Um, in the more remote parts of countries like Australia and Canada, where you've got an awful lot of, of land with not many people in it, um, they were used until very recently, uh, quite a lot. Uh, when they get replaced, they generally get replaced uh, by bridges. Uh, here's, here's one in Alabama in 1939, which is not that long ago. Um, but I'm imagining some of you are thinking, that is all very well, Lloyd, but we wanted about the biggest. Where was the biggest ever cable ferry? Well, I'm glad you asked because of course it's in Britain. Huzzah! And it's uh, operating today. In fact, there are three of them operating in parallel at Tor Point uh, in Plymouth down on the south coast of England. Now, uh, Britain experiences some of the most powerful tides in the world, and um, uh, Plymouth has a little stretch in, um, in the river where it's called the Hamos, and this little stretch of river has extremely strong currents, far too strong to send a ferry back and forth. It would just get swept away by the currents. Uh, so instead they have uh, powerful cables and these enormous ferries that ferry 8,000 cars a day across that little stretch of water. Um, and very frequently, the service is every 10 minutes during the day, and I think it's only every 20 or 30 minutes, uh, even in the, the, uh, the, the slackest parts of the night. So, there you go, the biggest and probably the best uh, on, on the Hamos little stretch of the River Tamar. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, move on now to uh, a new type of river crossing, which was actually the inspiration for this entire video. I thought, oh, I can make a video just about this, this one little way of getting across a river that a lot of people wouldn't know about. And yeah, it sort of grew. Anyway, that is something which Wikipedia calls the reaction ferry. But I, I'm, I'm convinced that they couldn't have been called the reaction ferry back in the day. The idea of equal and opposite reaction, that's, that's Newtonian physics. And Newton hadn't been born. He wouldn't be born until, until the Enlightenment. So um, uh, they would have been called something else. Anyway, the thing is, it's a brilliantly simple idea. Now, if you live today along the river Elbe, which flows through Germany from uh, the Czech Republic, you might be quite familiar with the reaction ferry, and you might be even a little confused. Well, surely everybody knows about these, because we have several of them. Yet, yeah, well, uh, today, around the world, there are a number of them that still exist, but they're actually quite rare. Uh, and most people don't know about them, and it's such an amazingly simple idea. So, uh, you want to get from that side of the river to that side of the river, and uh, you don't really want to have to put any effort. You don't want to have to winch on a cable or heave on ropes or do any of that, or paddle or use sails or drag with a horse. You don't want to have to do any of that sort of stuff. You don't want to get your feet wet. You want to get dry from there to there, preferably with quite a big load, a couple of wagons perhaps. Uh, and uh, for it to be um, easy and trouble-free. So, how do you do it? Well, you use a reaction ferry. Um, now, the first thing uh, you need to construct a reaction ferry is to get a rope right down the dead centre of the river. Uh, now, this can, of course, be a problem. Uh, one solution is that you whack in a massive pile, a huge tree trunk, which you bash into the riverbed and then attach a cable to that. Um, that's a bit of an engineering problem. Uh, a much simpler solution is uh, uh, to find an island. A lot of rivers have got an island somewhere in the middle and you use the island and attach it there. Another very simple one is you just get a bend. So if the river bends like that, you can just put the post on dry land there and then you've got your uh, rope that runs right down the centre of the river. And then on the end of that rope, you attach your ferry. Uh, a very common design was um, 
two pontoons, two little boat hulls if you like, uh, on the top of that you put a platform, sometimes referred to as a raft, but it's not really a raft because it's not doing the floating, the, the pontoons are doing that. So you've got a platform, and it can be quite a big platform, could get a few wagons on there, no bother. Right, so you're, you're uh, on one side of the river, on your reaction ferry, how do you get over there? Simple. The ferry has got a rudder on the back, or more often they had two actually. So uh, you might have a bar like that attached to the end of the tiller on the two rudders. So if you, pu if you push the bar that way, the two rudders on the back go like that. And the water, which is flowing down the river anyway, uh, hits these at an angle and pushes on them. Whoops, I just realised I've gone the wrong way, haven't I? Because I'm on this side of the river. So you realise your mistake. That's keeping you against the, the shore, safe for, for embarkation. Now everybody's aboard. You then move it the other way. And then they go like that. They catch the river on the other side. And then the entire boat crosses the river like that. It's so simple. Um, and there are a number of these uh, around the world today. There's uh, one at uh, Miravert on the, the Ebro in Spain, and that's been around, it's in uh, Catalonia, that's been around definitely uh, from uh, the medieval period. There's another one called the Traghetto di Leonardo in, uh, in Italy, which supposedly, as you might guess from the name, was designed by Leonardo da Vinci, though I would take that frankly with a pinch of salt. And uh, as I say, today they're quite uh, common, uh, still on the on the Elbe, but they were common on loads of other big European, uh, medium European uh, rivers, uh, the, the the Weser and the the Rhine for certain. And um, I mentioned earlier that, that the Hampton Ferry in, in England, uh, Hampton Load, it's sometimes called the Hampton Load Ferry, uh, and that seems to have been a strange hybrid because um, they had a cable stretched across with a traveller on it and then from the traveller was, was another cable to the ferry but the ferry was a reaction ferry so it was like a cable ferry and a, a reaction ferry combined but again I think that that arrangement is, is modern steel cables uh, the older versions of that same ferry wouldn't have used quite that arrangement um, so there you go, the reaction ferry um, and the big advantage of it of course is that when you get over to this side of the river this side of the river is now perfectly navigable. All the boats can go up and down here as normal. Um, and then when you're over here, this side of the river is perfectly navigable. So as long as the river is over twice the width of the, the ferry, you're laughing. Uh, or, or as, unless, of course, there's some plot when you, you, you go over here and you're crossing over to this side and you see he's passing you. His part, no, so you're crossing over to this side, he's passing you on this side, you're going, oh, yeah, Clark, you're going to get tangled in the rope. Well, oh, you can see how it could go wrong, but as long as people obey the signals, keep their wits about them, the reaction ferry. So it just uses the power of the river to get you across. It's just so simple. I know, so simple and so obvious. So there's another way to get across a river. So I've talked about their importance in geography, and I've talked about uh, the various types. I'm going to talk about one more thing, because I know a lot of you are very interested in war and battles and stuff. Well, um, if you're attacking a town, which is what most people did in war, and most um, uh, attacks were against something like a town, a fortified place, um, a node, very often towns spring up on rivers, and those rivers have bridges, and the bridge will naturally be at the town. So if, if there's a fight happening at a town or a castle, whatever, it's almost always very close to a bridge. But that's not really why the fight's happened. You're attacking the town, and just happen to have a bridge. But think about battles in the countryside. They almost always happen at river crossings as well. I say almost always. I don't have enough data to back that up. Uh, it, would be, it would take a fearsome amount of research uh, to, to, to back it up. But I wouldn't mind betting that actually most battles happened next to major river crossings, uh, reasonably close to, within easy reach of a major river crossing. Um, now, if uh, you look at this list of uh, battles that all took, part, uh, to, took place next to big fords, you'll see that that's quite a lot of major battles that are spread out over uh, time and space that took place next to fords. And uh, what I thought I'd do is I would, I would just Google, I typed in the battle of, and then the separate word bridge, and it spat out loads and loads of battles which have, which didn't just take part, uh, take place near bridges, they actually got named after the bridge, which of course most battles which took place next to bridges didn't get named uh, after the bridge, but an awful lot of them, a lot of them did, and here is a list of battles that have as a separate word the word bridge in their name. And again, you can see there are loads and they're separated widely by time and space. So why should this be? 
Well, if you are uh, in invading um, some land and you're traveling about the place with a big army, tens of thousands of men, uh, you've got the logistics problems. You're quite likely to follow rivers so that you've got boats in the river bringing supplies to you or, or moving along with you uh, along, along the, uh, the river. So that's one reason you would go along the river for supply reasons. But let's imagine that supply is not, not uh, that much of a consideration. Well, another thing you need is water. Uh, 40,000 men, an awful lot of horses with them as well, not just the cavalry, but all the horses pulling the baggage train. They're going to need an awful lot of uh, water, so being next to a river, that's a really good move. But let's imagine that you've got just infinite water with you somehow, and even that is not a consideration. You would still end up, quite often, next to a river crossing when the enemy turned up. So, it's a campaign. There are two armies in the field wandering around the, uh, the countryside, one in search of the other. Where do they actually meet and where does the battle then happen? Well, if you're on the march and you want to stop and you want to pitch camp, where are you going to do that? You're going to do it next to a major river crossing because you then command not just that river crossing but all the, the river between it and the next river crossings that might be many miles in either direction like the, 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 Brandy, the Brandywine Bridge was 20 miles away so you imagine it might be a, a 40 mile stretch of a river you now command and if the enemy turns up on the same side of the river as you and you want to fight okay great you fight not a problem and uh, when the battles uh, when the two armies are staring at each other for a while arraying all your guys they're drinking out of water bottles, they're fine, refilling their water bottles, but the other guys, a little away from the river, a little uphill, they don't have the water supply, so you've got an advantage there. And uh, the enemy, when he's trying to attack you, he can't get round behind you either side because there's a river there. And we are told many times, I have, many times I have read uh, some historians say that this commander uh, decided that his men would fight more bravely because they had the river behind them so they knew they couldn't run away. I'm somewhat unconvinced about this, and there's no way you could prove it anyway, because if they win the battle, how can you say that they won the battle because they fought that bit more bravely because they knew they couldn't run away because there was a river behind them? You can never prove that that's why they actually won. And when you look at the, the, uh, the story of the battle, there are usually other reasons, much more cogent and clear reasons you can come up with for why they won the battle. But we do know that when things go wrong and the army routes towards a river, they tend to get destroyed. So if it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. But anyway, we are told that some commanders I decided it was a good idea to have a, a, a river at your back so that your men know that they can't run away. Uh, anyway, so uh, you can fight. If you want to fight, terrific. Well, then you fight. That's what you came here for. But if you want to get away, well, you can go across the river crossing, which you command. And then if the enemy still wants to attack you because he's so keen, you could perhaps defend along the river. Um, in which case you're in a really good position and he's going to have a terrible time attacking you. Or you could just leave a rear guard of guys with fast horses holding the bridge. Most of the army gets away, then the guys with the fast horses jump on their fast horses and boom, they're away faster than the, the whole of the pursuing army can keep up with. Um, so you get away. No, 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 no. So whether, if they turn up on the same side of the river as you, uh, whether you want to fight them or not fight them, or, or hold and defend against them. It's all good. It's all good. You have all the options and all the advantages. But if they turn up the other side of the river, well, you can get away quickly. Same idea. Maybe you'll hold the bridge for a bit so the, the, the obstacle of the river keeps you safe. Or you can defend along the river and hope he attacks. Or if you really want, you could perhaps cross the, the, the river and, and attack him if, that's, if you feel that confident. You have all the options available to you if you're next to a, a, a river crossing. But... If you're not next to a river crossing and there's a river there and an army turns up, oh, you have so, so few options. You're not in anything like as good a position. So as you move across the countryside and you want to camp for the night, camp next to a big river crossing. So there you go. There's the, there's the, the last point I wanted to make. River crossings in war, terribly important. <laughs>